On a surface level, Metal Gear Solid 4 isn't a game I should like as much as I do. It's this gaudy, hypercharged continuation and climax to the Metal Gear series that is constantly pulling shit out of its ass, ruining and delegitimizing past titles with weird retcons and answers to questions that didn't really need answering. It's self-indulgent mayhem to the fullest extent, and while there are moments in MGS4 that made me wonder what they were thinking... Zero. The founder of the Patriots. Founder? When did this happen? When did this happen? Like I could probably make a video just about the things I don't like about it. Usually what dumb shit goes down is then followed up by like the greatest moment in video game history time and time again. It's unrelentingly legendary. The game takes the series' established cast of classic characters and places them into the most on-point, satisfying beast mode struggles you've ever seen them have to work their way out of. The oh shits per moment are off the charts here. From its large breadth of mechanics to the absolute breakneck series of events and situations you use them in, it's a goddamn anarchic ride that is doing everything it can to celebrate Metal Gear while ending it in style, even if it's tripping up over itself occasionally to do so. To start with, the premise of this game is pretty much perfect. Ten years after the last canonical game, where Solid Snake was the undisputed protagonist, after years of waiting, fans finally get their main character back, but as a weaker, tired version of himself. Subverting expectations by having players confront the fact that in reality, if you want the best for a character, sometimes it's better not to know what happens to them, because there's a good chance they may end up as a shadow of their former self. This was back in 2008, by the way, when writer-director Hideo Kojima seemed to have a bit of self-awareness about how long his bloody series had been going, before he decided to go back and quickly make up some more stuff Big Boss did to pad out a bunch more games. While undermining the player's expectations and not exactly giving them what they think they want, the choice to make Solid Snake an old man just also makes MGS4 a million times more legendary. Because now, instead of being another game where Solid Snake does his usual shtick and saves the day, it's about this weak, aged legend who, despite having everything against him, including his own body, rises to the fucking challenge and still goes out swinging. The cutscene at the opening that introduces us to this new, old Snake is one of the best scenes in the series. It's incredibly well directed and sets up Snake's return with the new premise that he's struggling to fight in this world where his enemies outrank him. But somehow he manages to pull it off and survive by the skin of his teeth. There's this weird sort of assumption a lot of people make that Hideo Kojima doesn't like Solid Snake because he made him an old man and generally likes to talk as if his dad is way deeper now, which he may have indeed been for a few seconds there before we got all the new newer games with the redone version of his backstory that tacks like four more betrayals onto it. But how does Kojima hate Solid Snake when he makes his final chapter in Struggle this mythical? Instead of just giving players Solid Snake back and telling them to have fun, Thor is like, okay, you wanted him back? Well, he's old now, so if you want him to survive and come out on top, you have to overcome the odds as the weary, drained individual he's become. Of course, in conjunction with a weaker protagonist to make us question if we can actually stomach seeing the thing we wanted back, MGS4 takes the struggle a step further, with a completely fucked up world warped by war and conflict. Illustrated with like 30 minutes of live action commercials you can watch at the start of the game. This is the first time we've honestly seen a lot of regular people in the Metal Gear universe, and you can tell here that the world changing events of past entries hasn't been kind to this culture. Do you even want to save this weird shitty world where you find something or someone to fight for? Something to hold on to while the world goes to shit, and ideology itself disappears. It's no longer about nations, ideologies, or ethnicity. It's an endless series of proxy battles fought by mercenaries and machines. It's not just that Snake has aged, but every returning character in this game is worse off than they were before. Everybody involved in the incident at Shadow Moses either lost their job and status, or in the case of Meryl and Mei Ling, got brushed aside. And I can only imagine how much Snake himself just wants to pack it all in. Frail protagonist and grim world accounted for, the game rounds things off by introducing the next level of Super Soldier Boss. Cybernetically enhanced psychotic victims of war who use their superhuman powers to murder and maim with glee. The Beauty and the Beast Corps get a lot of flack for being a group of bosses with no real discernible goals or personalities like the charismatic foes of previous titles, but here in this game they work brilliantly. In this world, the charismatic soldiers with personalities with goals and motivations? Is your age of heroes finally over? They don't fit in anymore into this kind of war, where conflict sans ideals thrives and war itself is the basis of the world's economy. Of course the villains here are soulless and insane, almost creature-like individuals torn apart and ruined by the very kind of conflicts they now fight for. But guess who beats them? The old charismatic idealistic hero of old, who without a mech suit or even a fully functioning human body kicks their fucking asses, proving that the human spirit is still the ultimate trump card. Ho <laughs> ho! of this while you're in the driver's seat. 
The camera spins around from cutscene to gameplay and it's on you to take them to task. Kojima also uses the BMB core as an opportunity to revamp the concepts of his bosses in the previous games, and bring out their full potential with the new power the PS3 brought to the table at the time. All of them adopting the motifs of the bosses from Metal Gear Solid 1, but now taken to their logical extremes. The Sniper Wolf fight in MGS1 was this simple confrontation where you stay on one side of the level and then shoot this woman's head a bit when it pops out on the horizon. In MGS4, Crying Wolf is this big epic war game where you're moving all over a map sneaking up on each other through a haze of snow, trying to literally hunt one another as a blizzard engulfs everything. Decoy Octopus, a man with the ability to camouflage himself as other people, didn't get to be a boss in MGS1. But taking on Laughing Octopus in MGS4 feels like what a fight against someone like Decoy Octopus would have been like. The boss pulling loads of crafty tricks on you, hiding in plain sight, etc. These allusions to previous games, of course, play into the larger scope of MGS4, which is trying to pull an encore to the series in as spectacular fashion as possible. Now, not every attempt to call back to a previous title works. There are some duds, some serious goddamn duds, and stuff that feels completely unneeded. Gotta love Snake going undercover as a more accurate version of himself. And Psycho Mantis's ghost showing up to yuck it up with some MGS memes is a bit much. Yeah, I get the sense that Kojima felt like he could include him without much justification because of just how iconic Mantis is. The ones hug at our memories that feel was a bit contrived. But I think it's way too dismissive to just say that fan service in any form is super inane and puerile and takes no effort to execute. Because the amount of care MGS4 puts into delivering on the potential each element of this universe had to excite is commendable as all hell. When it's not missing the mark, the people, the themes, the iconography is all back here to be used in interesting ways. Building up to a level that takes those emotions, those feelings of being with these characters again, and turns them into a bittersweet sensation that no other series has really done as well as this. Because while there's a lot of cool hype stuff going on, it's still all tinged with a feeling of longing and emptiness. Knowing that you're seeing everyone go through hell and suffer to be here, and that when it's all over, it might well be over for good for some of them. And none of this would work if the game didn't absolutely nail hitting those fan service sweet spots when it does. First off, the game brings back a huge majority of the original voice actors from previous Metal Gear games, and MGS1 specifically. And that goes such a long way into making it feel like these characters are still the same people they were 10 years prior. No matter how much the graphics may change, the consistent voices give the characters that authentic feel. That you really are catching up with these people years later. This isn't a training exercise. Our lives are riding on this. There are no heroes or heroines. If you lose, you're worm food. Yeah. You're all grown up. Maybe it's because someone taught me well. A certain legendary hero. Even if some of them aren't doing accents anymore. The graveyards are full of indispensable men. Wow, you know all sorts of great quotes, don't you? A wise man once wrote, the tongues of dying men enforce attention like deep harmony. Where words are spent, they are seldom spent in vain. It's also cool how MGS4 respects the previous titles by depicting the events that happened in them in flashbacks or in photos in the same graphical style they were in in those previous games. In other titles, it can be cool to see prior events recreated in a later game with higher detail. But to see that MGS4 views those previous games as prime for showing off again in their original form makes me respect it a lot for something that is otherwise trying to blow your socks off with modern detail. Every character gets a new twist to their arc and you see how the new world has changed them. The title rewards your commitment to the series so much by even taking what basically amounts to an easter egg character from previous games and then making them a VIP player, who ends up being one of the three mains on the final mission and whose bumbling actions actually hold the key to defeating the enemy. The game ramps up in quality all the classic touches of previous titles to make you feel like you're playing the next level of MGS. The next gen return, baby! Even the death screen has gone from a simple shout... Snake! What happened? Snake! Snake! to this epic as hell flashback montage thing that pulls you into like overdrive. Answer me please, Snake? The game returns to us the old cast with new hardships and demons. People can't remain in those glory days forever, and then to solidify that point, MGS4 turns the clock back, sending Snake back to Shadow Moses where MGS1 was set. But things have changed now, it's falling apart. Time has moved on. You spend all this time in the first three chapters reminiscing about the past, connecting with old faces again, but the core of the series, what so much of this game is calling back to, has aged. So has the Metal Gear series, and maybe it's time to wrap this story up for good. But not before giving those old stomping grounds one last hurrah.
After decades of waiting, the series about giant-ass mechs finally lets you pilot one. Old versus new. Metal Gear Ray was built to defeat Metal Gears like Rex, and we finally get to see if it can. By being in the fight ourselves, it's perfect. Here's the thing, though. I could list countless examples of moments where MGS4 delivers so hard on threads and ideas from previous games, or devises new ones I didn't even know I wanted and just smashes it, but I think it can all be summed up in the final boss fight. Two series legends fighting on top of Outer Haven to the sound of every boss theme in the previous games. If this isn't one of the most loving climaxes to a series, I don't know what is. The balls to be so in love with the DNA of your series that you decide to do something like this to cap things off is fucking amazing. Metal Gear Solid 4 is self-absorbed to a cocky extent. No, not all games or even all sequels need to be like this. But the fact that MGS4 is so dedicated to the core of its fans to deliver something for them, to the people who care, disregarding everybody else is why I'll always be in its corner. No, guess what? It doesn't give a shit if you think there's too many cutscenes that are too long or it's too self-indulgent in its own world and story. It's here with its amazingly animated and directed hours of in-game cinematics to give the people who care about these characters in this world the ride of their lives. And guess what? When these completely skippable sequences end, MGS4 is as game as game can be. Oh yeah, and also it used to have like this huge stealth multiplayer mode, which Konami took down years ago, that was basically just gameplay. So just keep that in mind. Running over items to pick them up as they click into your inventory, lightning fast animations that serve gameplay and not realistic movement, no parts where it takes control away to walk you through and shove your face in every little detail the game developers came up with. The only sequence anywhere near this is right at the end, and it totally earns it like no other game even tries to when it's it slows down its characters for the sake of cinematic ambiance. MGS4 gives you shitloads of mechanics to play around with, so many tools to get out and mess with. And since every scenario you're put in is really important, key to the story like every main MGS made before 4, I actually kind of want to mess around. Because unlike more recent Metal Gear titles, that was what Metal Gear was about, being in situations that mattered. Not just doing a random inconsequential job for someone you'll never see. Being in the moment, having the context for something epic and world-changing happening. That's why Metal Gear Solid 1 became as big as it did because it took action games and added this whole extra layer of epic context to what you were doing, and presented it in a polished, stylistic way little before it had really had the confidence to try to the same extent that Snake's 3D debut did. Not only were you partaking in something important, but for one of the first times it was being presented to you in a careful, considered style. Giving weight to those events, characters and emotions popped. Whether that's what you look for in games or not, that's what made MGS1 spark. What hooked players to it was this new step that digital entertainment took to putting you in a situation and making you really, really feel like it was important. Again, that it mattered. The buttons you were about to press were connected to this legendary chain of events. And that's what MGS4 is, ramped up to the max. MGS1, but with more freedom in both budget and technology to do what it wants. And a final tribute to the characters most of us were introduced to in that old PS1 game. But it puts a price on having them back. It makes us fight for who and what we want to see again, before giving us a chance to move on from the franchise. It's the end point, it's dark world and now tired characters are the price we have to pay to see these people again that we got invested in years ago. But MGS4 gives you the chance to elevate them from that gloom one last time. To earn the chance to see them be glorious again. To fight through the pain. It was never going to work out for me. It even rained the day I was born. You've got it all wrong. You were the lightning in that rain. You can still shine through the darkness. Because in the end, if we have something we love, like these characters, or the universe of this series, worth fighting for. No matter what the odds, we'll do it. Just like Snake. And at the end of the day, it's not some botched meta-narrative that makes us one with Snake. It's that. Metal Gear Solid 4 may not always have the brains of a Metal Gear title, but it definitely has the heart. One of the biggest I've seen a game have.
After the mess at Shadow Moses, Mei Ling kind of got put out to pasture. Hmm. Even so, making captain at her age, that's pretty impressive. Rumor has it she caught the eye of some lecherous old admiral who got her promoted. She always did have a thing for her older men. Hmm. Maybe it's too early to retire after all. Thinking of taking a little training on an analog vessel, Snake? 